Exams, exams, exams. These rituals of collective teenage torture are meant to prepare you for the rest of your life, and yet they resemble no other experience in it, except for all those other exams that you have to take if you keep passing them like a sucker. And there is no exam more ordinary than the college entrance exam. The consequences of these tests leave a lasting mark on our resume, our sense of self-worth, and our wrists. Check this shit out. They are supposed to identify your intelligence and your suitability for life in high academia. But if you've been to literally any fancy college, you'll know that their dorms are stuffed to the rafters with single-digit IQ holders who can barely pass an eye exam. So today, we're looking at exams. How they work, when they don't, and how they've already ruined your life. I was meant to catch that. But where did exams come from? The first recorded case of mass examination occurred in China, roughly 500 years after some Romans nailed a Palestinian carpenter to a tree. First instituted by Emperor Yang of the Sui Dynasty in the 5th century as an entry requirement to the Chinese civil service. Before the exams, officials got their places the old-fashioned way, through nepotism. I.e. they inherited it from them parents. By instituting a test, Yang widens the pool of applicants beyond the rapidly shrinking gene pool of China's aristocratic brats. It proved to be an incredibly effective tool, and the greatest achievement of an emperor who is otherwise regarded as one of the most brutal warmongers in Chinese imperial history. He was eventually choked to death with his own scarf by his own men when they mutinied against him and killed pretty much every man in his family. Yeah. Luckily though, Yang's exam lasted a lot longer than his bloodline. The test became mandatory for all government officials in the subsequent Ta'ang dynasty. And barring the occasional violent regime change slash Mongol invasion, the test was used continuously for the next 1400 years. It wasn't until the mustachioed Ming dynasty, however, that something resembling a college entrance exam appeared. Essentially, if you passed this exam, you could gain entry to one of the schools that could teach you how to pass the civil service exam. And this is a pattern we'll start to see throughout examination history. They have a habit of sort of replicating. Both exams, though, were basically memory games, based on a child's rigid and dogged memorization of the greatest hits of Confucius, with students expected to memorize over 400,000 characters of text. I can't even remember all the characters in The Sopranos. They're all just fat Italian guys. That was a joke, obviously. Tony, Bobby, Pussy, Vito. Don't test me. All this memorization may seem archaic for modern people who let machines remember stuff for them, but then again, being able to mindlessly regurgitate the worn out ideas of irrelevant dead people does still prepare you quite well for life at university and in journalism. But as long as there have been exams, there have been cheaters. While these exams were written explicitly for teenagers, any male of any age could take them. The exam was also very, very hard, so people usually took it more than one time. But older candidates were marked much more harshly and given harder questions. Picture an exam hall filled with freshly shaved 30-year-olds doing their best, how do you do my fellow kids, and you get the picture. But old-fashioned cheating will never be as effective as being rich. Wealthy families hired tutors who taught kids rapid-fire study methods which prioritized sections of the text, getting all that memorization malarkey out of the way. Publishers also created booklets of stock answers and past questions. Successive governments attempted to ban these, but it was a lucrative market with constant demand. And if that sounds familiar, you're getting ahead of me. For all its flaws and bizarre cruelties, the Chinese civil service exam created class mobility in China at a time when Europe was still wallowing in the early stages of feudalism. But much like gunpowder, tea, and deadly pathogens, once the exam reached Europe, it really took off. The concept itself travelled up the Silk Road during the 16th century, stored inside the skull hatch of a Jesuit priest named Matteo Ricci. Matteo Ricci. Being a mega-Catholic Jesuit, Rishi was impressed by the cruel and unusual punishment that the Chinese government were inflicting on so many children. But he was also impressed by the exam's rigour and meritocratic intention. Inspired by Matteo's suggestion, the Jesuits created their own entrance exam. So only the savviest kids could join their club for people who like to play Christianity on hard mode. It wasn't until the 18th century that European governments decided to crib from the Jesuits' Chinese cheat sheet and institute their 
their own civil service exams. Unsurprisingly, these exams were very popular, as they were a route to a respectable profession that didn't involve getting your face pulverised by cannon fire or rounding the Cape Horn in a cute little outfit. They were so popular that European universities were forced to create entrance exams too with the first being the German Arbiter, which is still taken in a radically different form by German school leavers today. It turned out that forcing students to prove that they were smart was quite a good idea. European universities were the dead centre of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. The grand entrances of these old institutions were finally flung open to people who got there on merit, when they weren't being blocked by the incest-riddled bodies of European aristocrats who were pushing on a pool door. SHOUT OUT MY HABSBURG DYNASTY! Universities like Oxford and Cambridge might be well known for their world-class education and expertly cut lawns, but they were also institutionally corrupt. And they still are, but that's a whole other video. Originally, students of noble blood would simply pay a little extra, and they wouldn't have to attend lectures or do any work. They just had to live there for four years, and they got a degree. But after a few centuries, more and more common folk were figuring out what all those letters and numbers meant. And when they realised who owned all those numbers, some of them got real mad. So exams became one way to occupy and placate these smarter, richer peasants who might otherwise spend their time gathering outside your palace with some kind of elaborate melon slicer. In Britain, the first public examination system was instituted in 1858, and kids were tested on a series of topics that wouldn't be too unfamiliar to British students today. As more and more students were able to prove their ability, nobility was replaced by the kids of people who were rich enough to send their kids to private school. Meaning that instead of sharing cousins, our leaders now just shared the same bunk bed at the same fucking private school. Progress is marginal. But this has always been the flaw with so-called knowledge tests. That they only test you on things that you learn dead in school. These tests do not function when they are given to a general population who hasn't prepared for them. But what if a test could measure the literal, unnurtured intelligence locked inside every student's head cave? Enter the study of psychometrics and IQ tests. First created by French psychologists in 1905, these multi-choice monstrosities were all the rage among American and European academics in the early 20th century. And they were widely perceived as an objective measurement of pure intelligence, in the same way that a blood test is a test of the stuff that's going around your body. I don't know, I don't know how the this isn't a video about blood tests, I don't know how they work. And this was based partly on the IQ test's super sophisticated, science ish sounding, standardised scoring method. Back then, people had a lot of faith in the newfangled social sciences, especially the sexiest one, psychology. So while all the cool psychologists were doing fun stuff like ringing a bell next to a dog's head or blaming your childhood for all your problems, psychometricians believed that they could communicate the capacity of the mind with cold, hard calculations. And IQ tests, to be fair, are, they're okay. They're pretty good. If you want to test someone's reasoning skills or identify children who might need more help in school. Or I guess if you want to join that high IQ club for middle-aged dweebs who still need teacher's approval, Mensa. Back in the 1920s though, there was another group of egomaniacs who were desperate to prove that they were smarter than everyone else. The eugenicists. Now, if you don't know what eugenics is, it's a bit like genetic studies, but with an added dose of racism. It's basically the not so neat idea of treating the human population like prized poodles breeding out undesirable traits and breeding in desirable ones. And eugenicists loved IQ tests because they seemed like an objective way to tell if someone was smart enough to have their procreation card taken away. One such eugenicist and Princeton scholar, Carl Brigham, helped organise the Army Alpha Test, the first mass-administered IQ test given to recruits in the US Army. A fundamentally broken test that relied heavily on vocabulary and cultural recognition and given to new immigrants and uneducated recruits whose grasp of English was only so-so. Regardless of this major flaw, Carl took all the results and put them in a book called A Study of American Intelligence, which was very popular among people who already had some preconceived notions about racial intelligence. He argued that the results were evidence of Nordic racial superiority and of the mental inferiority of black people, Jews, and Italians. Yeah. 
And while that's bad, the state of Virginia, famous for taking their sweet time moseying on into the 20th century, justified the forced sterilization of over 7,000 mental patients because of their low IQ scores. A policy that stayed in place until 1979. Yeesh! Do you care about your privacy, but have the terrible habit of being on the internet? Well, in that case, you should have a VPN. And if you buy any VPN, you should use the one that has paid me to do this ad, Private Internet Access. They keep your browsing private and your location secret. And better than that, they will also tell you if your email address and password have been compromised in historic hacks and scams. That's actually pretty useful. And it's available on all these platforms, including the one you use. So there's no excuse! They also have a strict no-logs policy, which means you'll be able to secure your privacy as well as I secured this bag. Or you can just use it to watch region-locked content which you normally can't access in your country, like American Netflix if you're British, and British Netflix if you're American. It works both ways! Use the link below and you'll be able to find some exclusive deals right alongside my stupid face. Complete digital privacy for less than $3 a month. And you get an extra free, free months with my link. That's a lot of free! And if you don't like it after 30 days, then you can get all of your money back free. But why would you do that when you can use private internet access on up to 10 devices? I know. It's good. Private internet access. To appreciate fully Harvard's age and historical significance, one should enter the yard by Johnson Gate. In the 1900s, the Ivy League and other elite East Coast colleges were extremely exclusive and were stuffed with more wasps than, well, a wasp's nest. Catholics and Jews weren't explicitly banned, but uh, there were often secret quotas on how many the universities would allow in any given year. But that hallowed institution of Harvard was different in that President A. Lawrence Lowell did publicly propose a specific quota on how many Jews were allowed in each year. But in the 1920s, Harvard got a new president, James Bryant Conan. And this guy was nothing if not ambitious. He wanted to create a national public examination system that every student in America would be party to. This way, he believed that you could create a natural aristocracy filled with people who were smart and not just rich like him. He wanted to meet some students who weren't from the Eastern boarding schools that traditionally farmed Harvard students. And one of these newfangled intelligence tests seemed like the fairest way to do it. And it was fresh off the success of his soon-to-be discredited work of super racist pseudoscience that the college board hired Carl Brigham to create the Scholastic Aptitude Test, also known as the SAT. It was first trialled on just 8,040 Harvard Scholarship candidates on June 23rd, 1926, who took the 315 question test with 97 minutes to answer them, but they weren't expected to finish. There were some math and some critical thinking questions, but the bulk of the exam was based on word familiarity. In this respect, the SAT has changed remarkably little over the years, but it has received a series of expansion packs. Notably, an essay section was added in 2005. But the SAT's most enduring characteristic is its ability to be simultaneously very simple and utterly impenetrable. Over the next few decades, the SAT spread through to more colleges in line with a rise in demand for a college education. A demand that exploded right after this happened. The 1994 GI Bill gave out tuition-free education to any veteran who wanted it. This led to an influx of over 2 million new, very twitchy students and a greater need to identify who was poor and smart and who was just poor. This job went to the Educational Testing Service, or ETS, whose job it would be to administer the test and to research testing in general. But any organization that owned the rights to a particular test would inevitably become more interested in promoting it than in honestly researching its effectiveness. Not my words, but the words of Carl Bingham in 1937. I should also note that Carl later recanted his beliefs in eugenics and became a ardent critic of the exam that he helped create. Which might explain why the college board waited until Carl was passing the worm food taste test before creating ETS in 1947. Since then, the organization has behaved just as Carl predicted it would. Like an aggressive wannabe monopoly, even though it isn't one. Today, actually, it's neck and neck with its longtime competitor, the ACT. 
But in a normal year, they are virtually guaranteed 2.2 million paying customers. Because ETS's real customers are the colleges who institute the exam, meaning that test takers have no way to meaningfully interact with the market. You just gotta take the test you gotta take. Before I keep going, I just want to make it clear that most other countries don't use psychometric exams. The only European one that does is Sweden, and if you've seen like one of their good four films, you'll know that this is a country that has a bit of a predilection towards self-inflicted misery. Most other countries go for a high-stakes knowledge-based test at the end of secondary school, like the Japanese center or the Korean Suman. Yeah, I pronounced that right. But with a country as chunky as America, you are going to need a universal yardstick to judge every school's reported grade point average by. But I'm gonna argue that that shouldn't be the SAT. Not by my own British bias standards, but by the original standards set out by the College Board. Okay, so, the original main selling point of the SAT was that it didn't test kids on what they learned in school. It wasn't an achievement test, it was an aptitude test. It's in the name. Like the IQ test it was based on, it was meant to measure innate or native intelligence, not learning. The College Board also had excellent data to show that a student's score virtually never changed each time they took the test, and crucially, that a score couldn't be made better through teaching or coaching. And that's how it was justified as an addition to all the other tests that kids already were taking in schools. Otherwise, it would just be an extra exam, a needless, pointless exercise that didn't teach kids anything practical other than the skill of alternating between your butt cheeks to make sure your ass doesn't fall asleep. Psychometricians will tell you that a test is only worth taking if it's both reliable and valid. Valid meaning that it will predict some future outcome, likely grades in college, and reliable meaning that if you take it more than once, you'll get the same result. A famously unreliable exam created in that period was the Myers-Briggs personality test. Now, Myers-Briggs was cooked up by Isabel Myers-Briggs, someone who had no psychological training whatsoever and was instead a failed novelist who'd never taken a psychology course in her life. She had read a bit about Carl Jung's personality types though, so she put them on a graph and then made a test based on it. There is nothing clever or empirical about Myers-Briggs, simply it's bollocks. More importantly, it's totally unreliable, with people getting radically different results each time they take it, probably depending on the mood they're in. At best, it's a half-decent workplace icebreaker, and at worst, it's astrology for people who like filling out forms. I don't care if you're an E-E-N-T-F or an N-T-F. I'm not taking your personality test for people without personalities! Anyway, to the SAT's credit though, it was very reliable, and that was a large part of what made it seem fair. Until about 1962. I wanna be an MBA. Hello, exams are toughy. Cause that's my SAT. I wanna be a yuppie. Don't count on love to make it happen. Prepare, prepare. We send the captain. So that absolute gem is for the Stanley Kaplan Education Center, named after this guy. The SAT is not egalitarian because it's not equal for everybody. So why should you listen to Grandpa Grumpy here? Well, he was the first to create an SAT preparation course, doing what ETS claimed was impossible, raising student SAT scores. Over the next few decades, the SAT preparation course became a standard bolt-on to a middle-class education, with courses costing thousands of dollars, pricing out poorer students, and turning coached SAT scores into college tickets for rich kids with lower grade point averages. The apparent validity of the SAT was called into question too. You could argue it just took academic or linguistic activities, called them intelligence, and then compared them to school grades. The reasoning was kind of, you know... By the 1980s, people were seeing the results from preparation courses, and ETS could no longer claim that their test measured innate intelligence or that it couldn't be prepared for, forcing the SAT to go through a series of embarrassing name changes because it could no longer call itself an aptitude test. Today, SAT stands for absolutely nothing, which does at least reflect its current contribution to a teenager's education. 
There were many attempts through the years to create fairer testing legislation, but these often failed thanks in large part to the College Board and the ACT lobbying together against these changes. Due to its centrality to the education system, much of the American curriculum has also been reverse engineered to prepare children for these exams. Even first graders are drilled in the art of answering multi-choice questions, which only really prepares them for life on a game show or in a police interrogation cell. But of course, the most pressing argument against this exam is that it's become a cause of the very disease it was designed to cure. It now facilitates the elevation of dumb wealthy kids and sidelines the poor ones. To their credit, recently ETS has now made SAT preparation courses available to everyone, but this completely contradicts the idea that it measures anything innate. And then, in May 2019, the College Board announced that they would now start working people's SAT scores out with an additional adversity score. On a scale of 1 to 100, the College Board will calculate a student's disadvantage level by looking at the student's neighborhood, family and school. This suggestion was received by the general population like it was a piping cold cup of sick. And it is hugely significant. I'm going to tell you why. Because what ETS are essentially admitting is that their test isn't fair. That it doesn't work without an additional score added to the tally. Made to level the playing field. Now, I spent the better part of a month learning about exams. And I think it's fair to say that I've learned some stuff. Exams are important. And they work but they have a use-by date. As time moves on, examinations need to as well to better reflect the changing society that they are supposed to prepare children for. In the SAT's case, it was broken by clever outsiders who were able to outthink it and the free enterprise of the market. If these exam makers weren't as insulated from the same process, then the exam might be more able to improve freely. Now, you might ask, what happened in China? Well, today they have the Gaokao, taken by 10 million students annually. The nine hour exam takes place over the course of two days and you only have one chance a year to take it. It's a vicious combination of subjects and disciplines and it is barring a few very small exceptions, the only qualification that Chinese universities will accept. The SAT may well be pointless, but at least it isn't cruel and unusual punishment. At some point in most modern lives, exams will likely cause you a great deal of stress. But you've got to remember that the only standards you should ever hold yourself to are the ones that you set for yourself and sometimes the ones that your loved ones set for you. Alright, that's it guys. Stay classy, stay in school, and if you're already not in school, fuck school and don't let the bastards grind you down.